the summer at Queller Prep. Um, so um, okay, so I went to Hunter High um, Hunter College High School. Um, I graduated this year, and I'm going into Columbia next year. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna be in my freshman year at Columbia. Uh, I'm gonna be dual majoring in math and chemistry. Um, so a bit about my background with the SAT. So, I took my first SAT beginning of junior year. Uh, I got a fifteen seventy, and I was satisfied with that. Um, and then at the beginning of senior year, so this year I just decided why don't I take it again and see what happens. Uh, and I got a sixteen hundred that time, which was uh really great. Um, and then also I got a uh, fifteen twenty on the PSAT. Um, so when when it comes to the SAT, I feel like I sort of know. Um, I I know what they're getting at, which I feel like is um, w with each question, I feel like that's sort of uh the crux of the test. It's not like it's not an intelligence test. It's not anything innate. It's really just understanding um what they're trying to ask, uh, and getting to the bottom of like each question, particularly on the reading. So yeah, I feel like I have pretty good knowledge of that. Uh, should I start going over the test now? Yeah, so what we're going to do is a question by question DSAT review, and we are hearing it straight from the source because we want to figure out how to get every single question right. And if you could also show the kids um, Desmo's calculator, I want to make sure everyone tries to use that online calculator, which is for free now as part of the exam. I'm going to put myself on mute and thank you so much for doing this on incredibly short notice. We are very happy that we're squeezing this in. Okay, go ahead. Should I start with uh, going over Desmos? You can start with that. That actually could work really well. So start with a calculator and then we'll do question by question. You could put the exam link if you want into the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll send the exam link right now. Um... You have screen sharing and everything enabled. It should all be fine. Okay. Um... All right, so here is the link to the test. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to start by going over Desmos. So Desmos is a graphing calculator uh, that you're allowed to use on on all parts of the math um, on the DSAT, which is huge. It can it can really um, help you circumvent a ton of calculation, a ton of like um like y y you if 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 you're skillful with Desmos, um you can really just get around a lot of <laughs> doing a lot of math really on the on the SAT. You can do the, the math part of the SAT without much math. Um, so, so De okay, so as I said, Desmos is a graphing calculator. Um, so if I were to graph, I could graph a line, um, I could graph a parabola, um, I can graph really anything if, if um, so, so normally you would graph a function by um, writing y equals, um, you know, whatever the function of f uh, of x is, or you could do f of x uh, equals, you know, whatever the function. So um, you could do that. Um, it also doesn't need to be strictly a function. So for example, I could graph y squared plus x squared equals one. So that's a that's the unit circle. Um, so yeah, I can really graph anything with that. Uh, a good thing to keep in mind, this actually comes up. Okay, well, I'll, I'll get into the other functions now. So you guys can see over here if I if I pull up the keyboard for Desmos and press functions, um, I see a bunch of different um, uh, different sort of subheadings that I can uh, look for functions in. So you have trig trigon trigonometric functions, uh, inverse trig functions, statistics. So this is actually a pretty great thing that it does, and not a lot of people know about this. Uh, you can just enter a data set. Um, uh, if you do the mean function uh, with the statistics part of it, you can just enter a data set and it'll tell you um, it, it'll tell you the mean. You could also do the same with median median. So yeah, the median would be four point five. Uh, so that's a good thing to keep in mind because not a lot of people know about that um, functionality that Desmos has. Um, then you have list operations and visualizations. You don't really need that. Uh, distributions, you probably wouldn't need that either. Uh, yeah, so you wouldn't need anything else. You might you might want to use the least common multiple or the greatest common denominator, but generally not. 
you're really going to be sticking to the trig functions, inverse trig functions, uh, statistics. Um, yeah, that's really it. Um, another thing to keep in mind that Desmos can do. Uh, so this will come up. You know, I might I might just spoil one of the questions. Um, and show you how you can sort of get around. Um, so so one of them. Okay, so this is the second to last um, question on module one of the math. Uh, it's really one of the hardest questions in this module and in, in the math part of the test. So it's telling you for each real number r, which of the following points lies on the graph of each equation in the xy plane for the given system. Um, so the first thing to notice is that this system of equations is really not a system of equations. It's, it's the same equation. It's um, You just multiply everything by a constant and you get um, the equation below. So really you want to see that um for all values of r for 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 all of these answer choices um it'll match up with 2x plus 3y equals 7 so for example a would be x equals r over 5 plus 7 and then y equals negative r over 5 plus 35 um so yeah a cool way that a cool thing that desmos does that that can help you sort of get around this question is so first i'm going to um type in the equation that it gives us. So 2x plus 3y equals 7. And there are something called parametric functions, which are defined as sort of, um, they're not defined as a relation between y and x. They're defined as, um, they're defined as a relation. So x equals some function of another variable, maybe t, and then y equals a function of the same variable. So an example would be x equals sine t. and y equals cosine t. So that's a parametric function because they're both, they're not defined as like a relationship between y and x. Uh, they're defined as um, both y and x have a relationship to a certain variable t. So the way we can input that into Desmos is by um, writing an ordered pair sine t and cosine t. So it, 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 you can see it gives us a sort of a range of values for t. So I'm going to change that to like 10 and negative 10 and 10. Uh, so this would be a circle. Um, but that's not really the point. The point is Desmos can do this and it can help you. It's sort of like a good good thing to know about Desmos. Uh, so for example, this question. Um, so you want to find which of the following equals 2x plus 3y equals 7, which of the following um, parametric equations. So what I can do is I can just replace r with t and type in each of these um, sort of equations into Desmos and see which one uh, essentially matches matches up with the line that I already entered. So the first one would be t over 5 plus 7. So that's x. And then y is negative r over 5 plus 35. So I'll replace r with t. So we can see here, um, that's a line all the way over here. So that definitely does not match up with our um, 2x plus 3y equals 7 line. Uh, so that's definitely not the right answer. Uh, then I can move on to the next one. So negative 3r um, over 2 plus 7 halves, uh, comma r. So I can do the exact same thing. So negative 3t over 2 plus seven halves, comma t. Notice that it follows our line perfectly. And if I extend the values of t that this is defined for, it continues following our line. So we can see that these represent the same equations. Uh, so b would be our answer because it's the same as the two x plus three y equals seven. And this is like, this would be a, a really hard question um, if you didn't know to do this with Desmos. So there are a bunch of little things with Desmos that you can sort of learn by playing around with it and uh, like getting to know it. Um, and I'll get into a lot of them uh, this this webinar. Um, and, and those little tricks will help you like really circumvent a lot of the doing the math on um, uh, on the math part of the exam. Um, so now that that's with that being said, I think I'm going to move. I'm going to go on to uh, module one of the reading. And sort of get through that. At around eight, um, I'm going to move on to the math, no matter how much we've done of the reading.
Okay. So, number one, uh, former astronaut Ellen Ochoa says that although she doesn't have a definite idea of when it might happen, she blank that humans uh, will someday need to be able to live in other environments than those found on Earth. Okay. So, one thing that stands out to me is the word someday. So, she's talking about like a potential, she's talking about like a, a potential hypothetical like uh, future, right? You know, someday humans might need to do this. Um, so usually um, with these sort of questions, they'll give you like a certain word that really hints at which one it'll be. So A, she demands that humans will someday, someday need. Nope. B, she speculates that humans will some, someday need it. Um, yeah, that, that seems to work because when you're speculating, you're talking about, you know, someday like this potential thing may or may not happen. So really to keep in mind, okay, I, I never want you guys to sort of just try out each word. Um, for these sort of questions and and see which one works. Um, because the thing to think about is that for every single one of these questions on every single one of these tests, they have like written explanation, particularly for the reading, they have written explanations of why um, the correct answer is correct. So why speculates would be correct and why the incorrect an answers are incorrect. Um, and so it's sort of like a, a really useful skills to be able to sort of um, anticipate what they would say. And to understand that it's never about like what feels right, because that's not an answer explanation, right? Like they would never write uh, like speculates is correct because it feels right. No, they're, they're going to write that specific clues in the text um, indicate that a certain answer is right. So what they would say for this answer explanation is that the, the word someday uh, indicates that she's speculating, right? Because she doesn't know whether it might or might not happen. Um, so always keep that in mind. It's that every single question can be determined from the text and you never have to go with like your gut or your intuition just like really look for clues in the text um so number two beginning in the 1950s navajo nation legislator annie dodge uh wanuka waneka uh continuously worked to promote public health um this blank effort involved traveling so she's continuously working it sounds like she's tirelessly working she's tenaciously working um so i'm looking all right which of uh, these words seem to reflect that. And I see that persistent reflects that, right? So you're continuously working. You're not getting tired. You're not giving up. You're being persistent with things. So yeah, this one should be C. Okay, um, number three, following the principles. Uh, by the way, um, I'm, I'm reading out all of these questions. Typically, I I would read just the sentence that the um underlined that the underlined um word comes in and then from that sentence if i can figure out the answer then then i'm good and i can move on uh but if if i can't get enough um en enough information from that sentence then you should sort of expand and look to the sentence before and after it you sort of want to zoom in at first and then uh narrow out or not narrow out like um zoom out as you like to get as much information as you need um because especially on the DSAT, like time is really of the essence. So you don't want to waste any time. And in t like typically for these tests, what I always say is um, don't don't try to get any more information than you need. So don't get caught up in like reading the passage because like you find it interesting or like you want to read the whole passage before you make your answer. No, look at just the sentence that the underlined word um, appears in. If that's not enough for you, then um, sort of expand a little bit, but never um, never look for like more information than you need. Um, Okay, so the sentence that this um, this underlined word is in is a collaboration between the Crow Tribe and Montana State University blank this model. Uh, tribal citizens worked around alongside scientists. Okay, so this I feel like is not quite enough information to answer it. So I would just look a little bit before that. It says, following the principles of community-based particip participatory research, tribal nations and research institutions are equal partners in health studies conducted on reservations. So a collaboration between the uh, Crow tribe, blah, blah, blah. So tribal citizens worked alongside scientists. That sounds to me pretty similar to um, tribal nation and research institutions are equal partners. They're the same. They're, they're really the same thing. So that shows that this collaboration is exemplifying that mo that model because it's, it's uh, really putting that model into action. Um, and you can see that this sort of correspondence between these two parts right here indicate that uh, 
that this this experiment or this collaboration is meant to be sort of like uh, an an example of the model. Okay, so just reading this, so it says the parasitic dawdler plant increases its reproductive success by flowering at the same time as the host plant it latched onto. Um, in 2020, Jian Chong Wu and his colleagues determined that the tiny dawdler achieved this blank with its host by absorbing and utilizing a protein. Uh, yeah, someone asked me in the chat, you should be looking generally at the so sort of, uh, okay, so someone asks, should, should you be looking at the connotations of the word choice in word and context questions? So that's a good question. I would say that with these sort of things, uh, more subtle things, so connotations that takes a bit more time, it's a bit more subtle than uh, things like specific, um, like like literal meaning or, or other things sort of, um, sort of, like they take less, they take more time than that. So sort of if, if there's a tie between um, two words, that have um when it comes to like literal me meaning then you can move on to more subtle things like connotation or you know whatever in general it's like look at the most obvious quick thing if 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 they're equal if if two answer choices are equal based on that then you should sort of zoom zoom out a little bit and look at more um more subtle things that take a bit more time because these tests are designed to be able to like uh to do pretty quickly so with this i always i always um sort of give the analogy that like you're sort of um, you're sort of like, uh, like unblurring or like sharpening a photo. So it's like go with the least amount of detail um, you can initially. And if that doesn't, um, if that doesn't indicate like a clear answer, then sort of um, uh, sharpen that image and go with more detail. Uh, and then if it still doesn't have enough information to keep on sharpening and like keep on going to, uh, for more, uh, more specific and more um, like sort of subtle uh, distinctions. Um, okay. So you can see it says it flowers at the same time as the host plant. So if it's doing something at, um, at the same time as the host plant, um, that, that to me sounds like synchronization. So yeah, this one would be A. Uh, some things that are, are a little hard to explain, um, but just look at here. You're talking about things. Uh, the phenomenon is where things like flower at the same time. Uh, so yeah, synchronization. Okay, uh, number five. Uh, so it says, given that the conditions in binary star systems should make planetary formation uh, nearly impossible, it's not surprising that the existence of planets ha um, planets in such systems has lacked blank explanation. So it should make um, planetary formation nearly impossible. So to me, it's not going to be... Uh, like the, the existence of planets, the explanation is going to be very complicated because it should be impossible, right? So you're going to have to like sort of justify things with that explanation and like go very in depth. Uh, so to me, that looks like straightforward should be the right answer, right? Because if something's nearly impossible, you're going to have to give a pretty complex justification for why it is possible. Uh, yes, so to me, straightforward makes sense. All right, uh, number six. Uh, Seminoli slash Muscogee director Sterling Harjo, um, blank television tendency to situate native characters in the dis in the distant past. This rejection is evident in his series Reservation Dogs. So he's rejection. He's rejecting, uh, some, uh, tendency by television. So they're really giving us a synonym for the word we're looking for. So we're looking for a synonym for reject. So to me, repudiate is a similar uh, is a synonym to rejecting. So yeah, that works. It's not going to be proclaimed, not going to be foretells, and not going to be recants. Uh, someone asked in the chat why um, number five would not be a discernible explanation. So, okay, a discernible explanation. So that's sort of... Um, so discernible sort of implies whether or not it's literally um, possible, right? So if I can discern an explanation, that means I can come up with them. So if it lacks a discernible explanation, that would mean it's actually impossible. But if it lacks a straightforward in interpretation, that would mean it's nearly impossible. Does that make sense? It's like if, if you can't discern it, then you literally can't come up with an explanation. So it is impossible. But if you can discern it, but it's just difficult, 
uh, it would be it would be lacking a straightforward um, a straightforward uh, explanation. Okay, um, so number seven, two thousand seven computer scientist Louis von Ahn, uh, was working on converting printed books into a digital format. He found that some words were distorted enough. Uh, that digital scanners couldn't recognize them, but most humans could easily read them. Uh, based on that finding, Von Ahn uh, invented a simple security test to keep automated bots out of websites. Uh, the first version of the recapture test asks users to um, type one known word and one of the many words scanners couldn't recognize. Um, can correct answers provide the, pr prove the users were humans and added data to the book digitizing project? Um, so... It's asking the main purpose of the text. So to me, that was a very informative text. It didn't, uh, it, it didn't use like florid language. It didn't like say, you know, recapture is the greatest invention ever. Uh, it just sort of explained how he came up with that. So A, to discuss Von, uh, Von Ahn's invention of recapture, that looks to me pretty good um, because it's sort of describing, you know, how, how he came up with it, um, his purposes behind it, and how it's sort of like evolved since he, since he first invented it. Uh, so, so to me, that seems to work. Uh, B, to explain how digital uh, scanners work. I always sort of like take these literally. Does it explain how digital scanners work? No, not at all. Um, it doesn't say like, you know, it, he wrote this code um, that like, no, it's it's much, it's it's not, it's not technical at all. So it's not going to really be B. Um, and then C, to call attention to Von Ahn's book, Dig Digitizing Project. Uh, it's not to call attention to it um, because it's okay so to call attention implies that it's sort of like more persuasive um or or i would want to see something ex that explicitly indicates that it would be trying to call attention to his um book digitizing product pro project uh but i don't see that and also i see that it's more of a discussion about how recapture works than um his book digitizing it's sort of recapture was um was was form was was um invented as part of his book digitizing product but it doesn't focus on the book digitizing um and then d to indicate how popular recapture is uh no it doesn't spend much time on that at all um why not to explain how digital scanners work well i mean just look for like does it explain how digital scanners work so uh, someone asked it in the chat. Um, so just reading it in 2007, computer science, blah blah blah. So there's no explanation there. Um, he found that some words were distorted enough that digital scanners couldn't recognize them. Also, no explanation. Uh, based on that finding, he invented a simple security test. Um, so there's really no explanation in any of these sentences. And then the first version of the recapture test asks users to type one known word, and one of the many words scanners couldn't recognize. So in none of this is is he is like the the writer talking about how they work. Or like to explain the sort of like technology behind them. He's just explaining like the circumstances of Von Ahn's invention of them. Okay, so this is a which choice best describes the function of the underlying sentence. Um, so for this one, um, just like the the fill in the blank questions, I would sort of just read the sentence, and then if that's enough to um give you like one clear answer then you can move on but if it's not enough then sort of go to the sentences before it and after it um and sort of like zoom out uh for, for the more information that you need so the sentence is the landscape out outspread below her seemed an enlargement of her present mood and she found something of herself in its calmness its breath its long free reaches okay so does that a create a detailed image of the physical setting of the scene okay it might so does it establish that the character is um, experiencing an internal conflict? No, it doesn't do that. Um, does it C, make an, ex make an assertion that the next sentence then expands on? Or D, it illustrates an idea that is introduced in that previous sentence? So for these two, it's like we can't really discern whether or not because we haven't read the preceding and following sentences. So now we have to read them. So the preceding sentence is, Lily had no real intimacy with nature, but she had a passion for the appropriate and could be keenly sensitive to a scene which was the fitting background of her own sensations. So if the scene is the fitting background of her own sensations, uh, that to me sort of correlates to how she says um, the landscape is an enlargement of her present mood and she found something of herself in it. Like to me, 
that seems pretty clear uh, as sort of like an elaboration on this about, okay, why is that? Um, why is the landscape like a fitting background for her own, for her own sensation? Uh, so to me, it, it sort of like elaborates on what, on the sentence before. Um, so that's why I would choose D for that. And then just to see, um, and, and so, okay. Also for A, it creates a detailed image of the physical setting of the scene. This is one where like you want to be literal. So does it do that? Uh, it's talking about just a general landscape outspread below her. Um, you know, it's calm that it's breath and that it has long free reaches. I don't know about you guys, but I can't picture what this landscape uh, looks like. And just from that, just from that, um, from, from that sentence. So it's not going to be A. Oh, I just highlighted it instead of drawing. So it's not going to be A. And then see, it makes an assertion that the next sentence then expands on. Uh, it says, on the nearer slopes, the sugar maples wavered like pyres of light. Uh, lower down was a massing of gray orchards. And here and there, there was a, the lingering green of an oak grove. Okay, so I'm not seeing... Uh, I'm not see so okay. The sentence, the underlined sentence, is about how the landscape, uh, ex like sort of amplified, um, was like really her present mood, like writ large and like amp amplified, um, sort of in nature. Um, so I'm not seeing in this sentence how specifically this landscape, um, how how it's an enlargement of her present new mood. I just see that it's just really more information about the landscape. So it's not going to be C. And yeah, that just leaves D. Okay, uh, number nine. So the sentence is using data spanning from 1994 to 2010 for a set of US companies. Uh, the team compared over 29,000 annual earnings forecast to the actual earnings later reported by the companies. Okay, so to me, that sounds like sort of methodology used in a study. Um, so does it A, summarize the result of the team's analysis? No, it doesn't. It says sort of um, the methods that they use to, to analyze it. Uh, does it present a specific example that illustrates the study's, study's findings? No, it doesn't. Uh, does it explain part of the methodology to use uh, used in the team study? So yes, it does seem though, se seem like it does. Uh, it talks about like they used data um, from 1994 to 2010 and they compared it. Um, and then D to call out a challenge the team faced in conducting its analysis. Uh, it does not do that. So it'll just be C. Okay, uh, number 10. Uh, so according to the test, to the text, what is true about mother? So Mother did not spend all her time in pain and paying dull visits to dull ladies, ladies, and sitting dully at home waiting for dull lazy ladies to pay visits to her. So right off the bat, we know that A is not right. She doesn't wish that more ladies would visit her. Uh, she was almost there, ready to play with the children and read to them and help them do their home lessons. Uh, besides this, she used to write stories for them when they were at school and read them aloud after tea. And she always made up funny pieces of poetry for the birthdays and, uh, and for other great occasions. Okay. So to me, C seems right because it, it, it literally says she creates um, stories and poems for her children. And then right here it says um, she used to write stories for them and um, and made up funny pieces of poetry. So like B might be true and D might be true, but those are going to be inferences. And in general, if you have like sort of something literally directly stated in the text versus an inference based on the text, the thing that directly comes from the text is going to the text uh, is going to win. So C is literally just like a restatement of what comes in the text. Uh, so it's going to beat out the inferences in B and D. Okay, uh, number 11. Uh, the following text is from Maggie Pogue, Pogue, Pogue Johnson's uh, 1910 poem, Poet of Our Race. Uh, in this poem, the, the speaker is addressing Paul Lawrence Dunbar, a black author. Okay, so... This is another main purpose question. Um, and so the poem is, Thou with stoke, stroke of mighty pen hast told of joy and mirth and read the hearts and souls of men and cradled from their birth the language of the flowers thou hast read them all and in, in the little brook, the little brook uh, responded to that call. Okay. So just going through the answer choices, does the A praise a certain writer for being especially perceptive regarding people in nature? So notice like sort of the two 
like sides of this question. So does it praise a certain writer? Definitely. Um, and then the other part is it um does it say that he's especially perceptive regarding people in nature? Well, it says he the language of the, of of the flowers thou hast read them all, um, and he read the hearts and souls of men. So you can see that both of these are reflected in the text. So this one's going to be true. Um, does it establish that a certain writer has read extensively about a variety of topics? Well, not really. I mean, it, this is more metaphorical language. And also, um, that's not the main purpose. That's one line of it. Uh, C, to call attention to a certain writer's careful and elaborately detailed writing process. So does it talk about his writing process at all here? No. So it's not going to be C. Um, and then recount fond memories of an afternoon. No, it doesn't recount any memories, so it's not going to be D. Okay, um, so number 12, To You is an 1856 poem by Walt, Walt Whitman. Uh, in the poem, Whitman suggests that readers whom he addresses directly have not fully understood themselves writing. Okay, so which quotation from To You most effectively um, illustrates the claim? And the claim is that you, the person, has not fully understood themselves. So just going through the answer choices, A is you have not known what you are. You have slumbered upon yourself all your life. Your eyelids have been the same as closed most of the time. Okay, I mean, to me, that pretty clearly gets across that the, re that the reader hasn't fully understood themselves. So A is looking right. Um, B, this, these immense meadows, these interminable uh, rivers, you are immense and interminable as they. Um, okay, that's cool, but that doesn't show uh, that we, ha we don't understand ourselves. Um, not C, and then not D. Again, for these, it's sort of like, go for the one, so if, if none of, okay, so if one of the answer choices directly, like directly basically restates um, the claim that you want to make, then that one's going to win. And then if none of them do, then sort of move on to like which one sort of implies it the best. Like always like go um, with the broad strokes first and then sort of the subtlety after. Okay, uh, number 13. Um, born in 1891 to a, to a Quechua-speaking family in the Andes Mountains of Peru, Martin Ch um, Champi is today considered one of the most renowned figures of Latin American photography. In a paper for an art history class, a student claims that Champi's photograph have considerable ethnographic value in his work. Uh, in his work, uh, Champi was able to capture the diverse elements of um Peruvian society, representing his sub subjects with both dignity and authenticity. Okay, so what's the student's claim? The student's claim is that Chambi was able to capture diverse um, elements of Peruvian society and represent them with dignity. Okay. So A is that Chambi took uh, many uh, commissioned portraits of wealthy Peruvians but he also produced hundreds of images uh, carefully documenting the people, sites, and customs of indigenous community of the Andes. Um, so to me, you can see sort of like that it does capture diverse elements from that, right? It said he um, he he took portraits of wealthy people and then also like um, indigenous people uh, from the Andes mountains. Um, so that to me looks like it could be right. Um, B. Chambi's photographs demonstrate a high level of technical skill as seen in his strategic strategic use of illumination. So no, we don't care about his technical skill. We care about whether he captured the diverse elements of Peruvian society. Um, C, during his lifetime, Chambi was known to celebrate both within and outside of his native Peru, as his work was published in places like Argentina, Spain, and Mexico. Okay, well, we want to focus on the aspects of Peruvian society, not in general like uh, South American society and uh, like the Spanish-speaking society like Spain. Um, and then D, some of the um, people and places Chambi photographed had been long popular subjects for Peruvian photographers. Again, that, if anything, would show that he isn't capturing uh, like any new information about um, the diverse aspects of Peruvian culture. So out of all of these, A works the best. Okay. Um, by the way, so you can see that like a lot of these... Okay, the thing about the DSAT is it's very fatiguing. I feel like compared to the actual to the paper SAT, uh, because you have to read specific, you have to read um, like entirely new passages per question, 
Um, so for this one, I would like for the DSAT, I would take like a, a second to like reset before you just plow into like a new paragraph or like a new like block of just text and sort of just reset um, and, and, and then go. Like don't get caught, don't get caught up in like the, um, don't get too caught up in like the flow of the text, the test, uh, because then you'll probably end up getting fatigued. Um, okay. So the question is, which choice most effectively uses data from the table to complete the example? Okay, so we want to zoom in on what the example is um, uh, in, in this text. So some researchers studying indigenous actors and filmmakers in the United States have turned their attention to the early days of cinema, particularly the 1910s and 1920s when people like James Young Deer, Dark Cloud, Edwin Carewe, Car 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 and Lillian St. Sire, uh, known professionally as Red Wing, were involved in one way or another with numerous films. In fact, so many films and associated records of this era have been lost that counts of these four figures output should be taken as bare minimums. Okay, so that's what we want to get across. Um, so we want to we want to get across that the data in the table is essentially a bare minimum. Um, so does A do that Dark Cloud acted in significantly fewer films than did Lillian St. Sire? Uh, no, it doesn't. It just compares two of them. Um, Edwin Car Car Carew's um, 47 credited acting roles only includes films uh, made after 1934. Okay, so that could work, but no, it literally only includes, it, it doesn't include any films made after 1934. It only includes the films made from 1912 to 1934. So maybe that would work and show that um, the, the numbers are, are less than, than we know, but it's just not true based on the text. Um, okay, so uh, Lillian St. Lillian Saint Sire acted in far more than 66 films, and Edwin Carew directed more than 58. Okay, so that's indicating to me that both of these numbers are bare minimum, so that seems to work. And then D, James Young Deere actually directed 33 films and acted in only 10. Um, so, so to me, that doesn't really show that they're bare minimums as much, um, because these are still like the numbers of, um, I mean, obviously they're flipped, but it's still the numbers of time. It's the same numbers as in the table, so it doesn't show that like the numbers are greater than they appear. So yeah, for 14, I would say C. Okay, so we won't, okay, so which choice best describes data from the table that supports the researcher's uh, claim? So let's look at what the researcher's claim is. Um, Alicia Montesinos Navarro, um, Isabel Storer, and Rocio, uh, Rocio Perez um, Barales um, recently examined several plots within a diverse plant community in Southeast Spain. Uh, these researchers calculated that if individual plants were randomly distributed on this landscape, only about 15% would be in other would be with other plants in patches of vegetation. Uh, they counted the number of juvenile plants of five species growing in patches of vegetation and the number growing alone on bare ground and captured those numbers to what would be expected and compared those numbers to what would be expected if the um if the plants were randomly distributed. Okay. So they claim that um, plants of these species that grow, in uh, that grow in close proximity to other plants gain an advantage at an early developmental stage. So that's what we want to show. And what we want to do is we want to highlight that the data and the table uh, percent patch uh, found in patches of vegetation is much higher than 15%, which is what, the, what it would be if we were just uh, randomly distributed. So we want to, uh, it's always good to like sort of predict what the answer could be uh, before you read the answer choices. So essentially what we want to do is show that all of these numbers are much higher than 15%. So does A do that for all species, uh, for all five species, less than 75% of juvenile plants were growing in uh, patches of vegetation? Nope, that's not good. Uh, the species with the great, greatest number of juvenile plants growing in patches of vegetation was H. Stochas. So no, because it doesn't show that it's higher than 15%. It just says it's the highest, which it could be the highest at 1%. So it doesn't show that. Um, C, for T, for T. Libanidis and uh, T. Moraderi, uh, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in pa patches of vegetation was less than what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed. No, we want, first of all, that's not true because it's greater than 15%. And we want to show that it's greater than uh, what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed. And so that leaves D, 
for each species, the percentage of juvenile plants growing in uh, patches of vegetation were substantially was substantially was substantially higher than what would be expected if the plants were randomly distributed. So yeah, that proves the point because it shows that um, actually no, these aren't randomly distributed, and they want to like these plants want to grow in patches of vegetation. Um, and it's also true based on the on the table. So be careful of like um of answer choices that like that that maybe do get the claim the claim across but also aren't true. So the example was the one over here like uh uh like A would have actually or B would have actually worked if it weren't untrue. So it has to fulfill those two requirements is that number one is actually true and two it does prove the claim the 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 claim. Okay. Um Number sixteen, uh, in the mountains of Brazil. Um, okay. Well, which true? Okay. First, first of all, I'm gonna read the the question. Which finding, if true, would most directly support the researcher's hypothesis? Always read the question first. Um, before the passage. Well, not always. Um, but when it's when it's something like when it's a a quick question to read and you don't really need too much information about the passage to understand the question, I would read it first. Um, so you want something that supports the researcher's hypothesis, so I would look at what the researcher's hypothesis actually is. Um, so 16, in the mountains of Brazil, Barbacenia tomentosa and Barbacenia macrantha, uh, two plants in the Veloziaceae. Oh, all of these have like super hard to pronounce the uh, words in the passages. Um, family, establish themselves on soilless, nutrient-poor patches of quartzite rock. Plant ecologist Anna Abrahau and Patricia de Brito Costa um, used microscopic analy analysis to, de to determine that the roots of B. tomentosa and B. macrantha, uh, which grow directly into the quartzite, have clusters of fine hairs near the root tip. Further analysis indicated that these hairs secrete both malic and citric acids. Um, uh, the researchers hypothesized that the plants depend on dissolving. Okay, so hypothesized. So this is the hypothesis we want to true. We want to show this true. Um, so the researchers hypothesized that the plants depend on dissolving underlying rock with these acids and um, as the process not only creates channels for continued growth but also releases phosphates that provide the um, vital nutrient pho uh, phosphorus so so yeah so the hypothesis is that by dissolving the underlying rock um they get the nutrient phosphorus which is very important uh that's the hypothesis and now let's read the answer choices so a other species in the V, I'm just going to say V family because I, I can pronounce that. Uh, other species in the V family are um, found in terrains with more soil that have root structures similar to those of B. tomentosa and B. macrantha. Uh, no, that doesn't show it because we want to uh, show that how they thrive in like nutrient poor patches of, uh, of soil. So A doesn't show that. Um, B, though B. tomentosa and B. macrantha both secrete uh, citric and malic acids. Each species produces the acids in just different proportions. I mean, okay, that's cool, but it doesn't show that um, they need the nutrient phosphate. Um, okay, C, the roots of B. tomentosa and B. macrantha carve new entry points into rocks, even when the cracks in the surface are readily available. Uh, so to me, that shows that it's true, because if they're... Okay, so so um the the hypothesis is that like specifically by dissolving underlying rock and by growing into the rock, uh that's what they need to do, not to just be in the rock. They need to grow into the rock in order to dissolve it to get phosphates. So it seems to me that C does that. It it proves that because it shows that they carve new entry points into rocks. And so specifically the carving into rocks, not just being in the rocks, that um gives them the nutrients. So C seems right. And then D, B. tomentosa and B. macrantha thrive even when transferred to the surfaces of rocks that do not contain phosphates. Nope. I mean, we want to show that the phosphates are what's important. So 16 would be C. Okay. Um, so which choice most logically completes the text? Uh, that's what we're looking for. So now let's read the text. Um, Herbivorous uh, sauropod dinosaurs could grow more than 100 feet long and weigh up to 80 tons, and some researchers, ha researchers have attributed the evolution of sauropods to, to, such, to such massive sizes to increase plant production resulting from high levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide during the Mesozoic, Mesozoic era. So essentially, um, like more carbon dioxide led to more plant growth, 
which led to bigger dinosaurs, is, is, what, uh, is what it's saying so far. However, there is no evidence of significant spikes in carbon dioxide levels coinciding with relevant periods in sauropod evolution, such as when the large sauropod um, appeared, when several sauropod lineages underwent further evolution towards gigantism, or when sauropods reached their maximum known sizes, suggesting that... Okay, so if there's no correlation between the um, CO2 levels and the size of the sauropods, it's suggesting that the hypothesis is wrong. So I want to see which... So the choice I want to basically see saying that the hypothesis is wrong. Uh, so A, fluctuations in atmospheric carbon dioxide affected different sauropod lineages differently. Okay, I mean, that's kind of irrelevant, and does, it doesn't show that the hypothesis about CO2 causing gigantism is wrong. Um, B, the evolution of larger body sizes in sauropods did not depend on increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. So to me, that looks right, because it's saying specifically that causal link that was um, sort of delineated in the first sentence is not true. So it's not true that increased atmospheric carbon dioxide led to larger body sizes in sauropods. Uh, so yeah, to me, B seems right. Okay, uh, this is another completing the text question. So in documents called judicial opinions, judges explain the reasoning behind their legal rulings. And in those explanations, they sometimes cite and discuss historical and contemporary philosophers. Legal scholar and philosopher Anita L. Allen um, argues that while judges are naturally inclined to mention philosophers who views, whose views align with their own positions, the strongest judicial opinions consider and rebut potential objections. Discussing these, discussing philosophers whose views conflict with judges' views could therefore... So the causal link that this established is that um, rebutting potent, potential objections, so looking at philosophers whose views conflict with the judges' views, okay, like these are uh, basically synonymous, uh, essentially make it strongest, right? The strongest judicial opinions do that. Um, so we want to we, we wanna look for, like, basically whichever one uh, is telling us that uh, doing this makes better judicial opinions. Okay. So A, does it allow judges to craft more um, judicial opinions? Um without needing to consult philosophical works? Uh, definitely not, because they need to consult more to do that. Uh, does it, B, help judges improve the arguments they put forward in their judicial opinions? I mean, yeah, that seems right. It makes better judicial opinions and more strongly argued ones. Uh, so B seems right. And then C, does it make judicial opinions more comprehensible to readers without legal or philosophical training? Uh, no, it doesn't do that. Um, definitely not because it it, invo it it involves like putting more philosophy in the judicial opinions. So it would be you'd be you need more uh, philosophical training. And then D, does it bring judicial opinions with line in line with the views that are broadly held among philosophers? Uh, no, because it's more on a case by cases of like by judge and what they disagree with and agree with. Um, so no, it doesn't do that. Okay. Now this is okay. I always love coming to this part of the the test, um, because for everything else we had to read these big old like blocks of text, and for this one we just sort of have to uh, do a little like grammar stuff, so it's much easier. Um, so I'll just look like for this one for these questions, just look at the immediately surrounding context of, uh, of the of the fill in the blank, and then again, as I always say, if you don't have enough information based off of that, then zoom out and zoom out and like get with more detail and more detail until you have like a until like the tie between uh, different answer uh, choices is like is broken and like one of them is clearly right. Um, so Japan achieved a 40% reduction in plastic baggies after cashiers were instructed to ask customers whether blank wanted a bag. Okay, so who you're asking who's the blank referring to? It's referring to the customers. So that's a group of people. So it's going to be they or we, but it's obviously not a group of people that we're a part of. It's like customers. It's like a different group than us. So this one's going to be A, they wanted a bag. Okay, um, number 20. Epicurus defined pleasure as the absence of pain in the body and of trouble in the blank, um, that all life virtues derive from the um, absence. Okay, so, so we see here our answer choices. It's all about punctuation, right? So these two answer choices have semicolons and colons in them. 
and those are not going to be right based on the fact that um when you have a semicolon or a colon um specifically a semicolon a semicolon separates independent clauses that without conjunctions so what that means is an independent clause is a sentence that's a complete thought and can stand on its own so for example if it was so positing that all life all life's virtues derived from this absence that's not a complete sentence because it doesn't have a subject or uh, it doesn't have a subject and predicate it just has a predicate um so you wouldn't use a semicolon there um maybe if it were they posit right they posit then maybe the semicolon would work because they posit that all life's virtues derived from this absence that's an independent clause it's a it's a it's a sentence that can stand on itself on its own and it's um it's a complete thought so maybe if it were that it could work um with a semicolon or a colon but it's not that so it's not going to be a semicolon or a colon um and then a period is even stronger than the semicolons and colons so if if this were its own sentence positing that all life's virtues derived from this absence that's obviously not a sentence that can stand on its own so it's going to be a Okay, um, so it's another fill in the blank. So blank findings were based on a famous Equus Ray image. So who is the blank referring to? Uh, it's referring to Watson and Crick, right? Two um, British researchers. Um, so that's a group of people. So it's going to be their findings. Uh, a is they are. So that's not going to work because they are find they are findings were based on famous X ray images. That's not going to work. Um, it's finding. Those aren't it's. Those are those are people. And also it's a singular, so and it, it's also it is finding, so that doesn't work. Uh same with same with D. It's findings, those are people. Why are you making them like not human? Uh so C is gonna work. And their findings were based on a famous X-ray image. Okay. So this is actually a great example, a great question to teach from. So a film that critic, okay, so all of these are basically saying the same thing. So a film that critic Steiner Chin claims expanded the range of possibilities for Asian images on screen. Okay, so with this, I sort of talk about this to my class a lot. So when you see sort of like the verticality of like these answer choices, notice how like all of them are, are the exact same, um, but they have different punctuation. <laughs> They're all critic Steiner Chin claims. So it's like that's meant to call your attention to just the punctuation. And it's supposed to like sort of uh, like immediately call your attention and just look at um, like the entire question is based on whether or not you should put that comma there. So basically the secret for whether or not you should put that comma uh, between like uh, so like comma someone's name is that if the if if what comes between the commas is removable, then you can put commas there. So. If if it were critic comma Steinichin comma claims expanded uh the range of possibilities, that would mean that that Steinichin could be removable, and it would mean that like uh the sentence without it would make sense. So let's test out if that sentence without it makes sense. It says a film that critic, a film that critic claims expanded the range of possibilities for Asian images on screen. Okay, so a film that critic that doesn't make sense. It should be like a critic or like a certain critic. Um, so clearly that what comes in the commas the Steinichin. is not removable um so it's not going to be a if it were a critic steiner chain claims expanded uh the possibilities for asian images on screen that would work because we could get rid of uh steiner chain and it would be just a film that a critic claims expanded the um the range of possibilities like that would work because it would be removable but if it's just critic steiner chain that's not removable uh so it's not going to be a it's not going to be b um and then It's just going to be C because it's really just the critic Steinachin claims this. You don't want to like break that up with punctuation with commas. Um, just sort of like say the sentence as naturally as it sounds. So yeah, it'll be C. Okay. Um, I want to move on to the math soon, but I'm going to do. I'll I'll finish up this page and then move on to the math. Um, yeah, I think that should be good. So, 23, uh, just look to the sentence where the blank appears. So, some historians blank that this tulip mania. So, 
clearly looking at like the verticality of these answer choices, it's all form of claim, right? So that's not within question. It's just like, what tense of claim do you want to put there? Um, so some historians, so historians is plural. So you're going to use the plural form of claim, which is just claim. <laughs> Uh, not going to be some historian, historians claiming, some historians having claimed, or to claim, just claim. All right, uh, number 24. Um, so I'll read the whole sentence this appears in. So researchers studying mag... All of these huge words that I have to read. Uh, magneto sensation have determined why some soil dwelling round worms in the southern hemisphere move in the opposite direction of Earth's magnetic field when searching for blank in the northern blank. In the northern hemisphere, the uh, the magnetic field points down into the ground, but in the southern hemisphere, it points up towards the surface and away from the worm's food sources. Okay. So thing to notice is that this is a this is a full sentence and it's a quite a big sentence. Uh, and then this, I mean whatever ends the sentence, so it ends with food, that's also going to be a full sentence. So you're going to need like a strong punctuation mark. A comma is not going to work. And certainly no comma is going to work. Uh, no comma is not going to work. Um, and then, yeah, same for C. A colon would work because um, like a, what a colon... Okay, so a colon has a bunch of different uh, uses. So um, some of them, just going through some of them, one of them is to uh, define a term. So if I say like, I came up with the word... Uh, I don't know, some random word, uh, and then I defined it. Uh, it could be less literal than that, but like in general, defining a term, uh, you would use a colon for. Uh, to begin a list, you'd use a colon for. And you can also use it for um, if whatever comes um, after the colon is sort of um, an explanation or what I call a corollary, which is like uh, something like a, a direct logical consequence of what comes before. So if what comes after is a, 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 an explanation of what comes before, um, you would use a colon there. And you can see that this is like in the northern hemisphere, the magnetic field points down, blah, blah, blah. That is an explanation of why uh, the soil dwelling roundwards in the southern hemisphere move in the opposite direction, blah, blah, blah. It's an explanation of that. So you would use a colon here. Okay, and then last one I'll do before moving on to the math. Um, scientists believe that unlike most other species of barnacle, uh, turtle barnacles, I'm not even going to try to read that, um, can dissolve the cement-like secretions they use to attach blank to a, t uh, a sea turtle shell. Okay. So look to what the blank is talking about. The blank is talking about turtle barnacles. So that's something plural. So it's not going to be it. It's not going to be itself. It's either them or themselves. Uh, and it's going to be themselves because them themselves, it's sort of like, it's the, um, it, it's the reflexive use of um, of a pronoun, so it indicates that, like, it's it's the action. Okay, so when you have, like, self after a pronoun, so, like, himself, herself, themself, themselves, um, what that indicates is that the person doing the action and the person receiving the action are the same person, are, are, are the same thing. So here we have the turtle barnacles. Um, so those are the one doing the action, which is the um, the attaching. They're doing the attaching. But then they're also receiving the attention because they're the ones being attached to the sea, sea turtle shell. So the person doing the action and the person receiving the action are the same. And it's both turtle barnacles, so it'll be B themselves. Okay, um, so that's as much as I want to do of the English. Um, do you guys have any like burning questions that you want to go over, like what we've done uh, on these questions so far? You can tell me in the chat or you can just unmute yourself. All right, I got something in the chat. Um, uh, someone said, what should you do if you don't know the meaning of words at all in word and context questions? Okay, so that's a good question. Um. So typically, if the word is like completely just like out of left field and you've never seen it before, that's like, t okay, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys have better vocabularies than like average, because in general, the people um like who go to color prep tend to be like, you know, pretty, pretty smart. Uh, so if, if, if the answer choice, if the correct answer choice is not known by like you guys who are like definitely like, like probably have better vocabularies than the average, 
um then it's they they there there's no like logical reason why they would make that the answer because they don't want the answer to be something that's completely out of reach for most people so if, like an example if if um if the answer is like completely just out of left field and just uh like a word you've never seen before um then i wouldn't uh choose it um so yeah and in general i would say just like read a lot to get a better better vocabulary um read for pleasure it's going to increase uh, your vocabulary and it's also something that you can like enjoy doing um if you're really like if you don't want to do that uh there are some like a bunch of there are a bunch of like quizlets um for sat words so you can look up like 500 must know sat words i think that's like what uh one of these quizlets are, are called um if you do like those quizlets you probably uh like learn all the words you need to know for it for the sat uh so yeah if you really don't want to read uh you can just do like the vocab quizlets Um, so I have another question about 22. Um, if you were to replace option C with critic Steinachin, comma claims, would the answer still be correct? Um, wait, this is the wrong module. Okay. Um, so if it, okay. Yeah. So if it were a critic, um, Steinachin, comma claims, um, no, that wouldn't be correct. Um, because whatever comes after the comma, that needs to, um, so usually a comma is going to have to, so, okay, essentially like claims, um, expanded the range of possibilities for Asian images on screen. So usually a comma in, in that context, it would be used to separate an independent clause with a conjunction or like, let's say you change it to claiming or, well, actually that wouldn't work. Um, but no, so like the comma wouldn't work. Uh, because you need a preposition, so like for and but, uh, nor like fanboys is like the 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 common like ac acrostic for um, for for your uh pre for your conjunctions, um. So you need a conjunction after the comma for uh for it to make sense to put a comma there. Um. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the math now. Um, so sorry if you guys have any more questions, but I need to get on to the math. Okay, so I want to do the math very quickly, spe uh, specifically like the first few questions, because like the the first, you know, I would say five to ten questions are you should be able to um do then do them in your head generally. So what is ten percent of four seventy? I didn't mean to put a check mark there. Uh, ten percent of four seventy. That's just one tenth of four seventy. So, uh, move the decimal point one over. That's gonna be forty seven. Boom done. Um. Which equation has the same solution as the given equation? So you could solve this um, and say that uh, see that x equals three, or you can just see that subtracting six on both sides is going to give you c. Um, so yeah, um, e, e, like I I mean honestly I would just um, since this takes so little time to solve I would just say you know x equals three. So look through all the answer choices that have x equals three, um, and then two uh, c definitely does. Um, all right, number three, the total uh, cost in dollars to rent a surfboard consists of a $25 service fee and a $10 per hour rental fee. Uh, fee. A person rents a, a surfboard for two T hours and intends to spend a maximum of 75 um, to rent the surfboard. Okay, so the service fee, that's a one-time purchase. So that's going to be your Y-intercept because even if you surf for like zero hours, you still have to pay that one-time purchase. Um, and then $10 per hour. So for every hour, you're going to have to pay $10. So it would be 10 T. And if it has a maximum of 75, so maximum means that whatever whatever um has a maximum of whatever. Okay, that sounded confusing. Maximum means the less than or equal to. So if this quantity has a maximum of 75, it's the less than or equal to 75. So it's going to be 25 plus 10t is less than or equal to 75. So t. All right, each face of a, four, of a fair 14-sided die is labeled with an, a number from 1 through 14. Uh, with a different number appearing on each face. If the die is rolled one time, what is the probability of rolling a two? Okay, so uh, the formal definition of, of probability is the number of, of ways you can have success over the total number of ways that the action can happen. So the only number, the number of ways that you can have a success essentially rolling a two is one, right? You can roll a two, that's the only way. And then the number of ways that the action can happen is 14. 
because you have it can land on any any of the 14 sides because it's just going to be one fourteenth. so a okay um a printer produces posters at a constant rate of 42 posters per minute at what rate in posters per hour does the um does the printer produce the, the posters okay so i like to use okay so this is a pretty like straightforward question but when when this sort of like unit conversion questions get less straightforward i like to use like units unit conversion on like units canceling out so we have 42 poster 42 posters per one minute so that's the rate and then i want to multiply this by the number of hours in, in the number of minutes in one hour um but i'm going to use the reciprocal of that uh wait no actually not um so i'm, I'm going to do 60 60 minutes um per one hour because i can see that if i multiply it by that the minute so okay a thing to keep in mind uh one thing that sort of lets you um keep track like to keep track of the unit conversion is that units cancel out when they're the numerator and denominator, just like um, just like integers do. Um, so if you have minute over minute, that's going to cancel out. And what you're left with is just going to be posters per hour. Um, so it's going to be 60 times 42 posters per hour. And then, yeah, just some quick multiplication. So 40 times 60 is going to be 2,400 plus two times 60, so 2,400 plus um, 120, that's gonna be um, 2,520. 2005, so 2,520. All right, the function f is defined by, by the equation f of x equals seven x plus two. What is the value of f of x when x equals four? Okay, very straightforward question, just put in four, um, plug in four for x, so you're gonna have seven times four, plus two equals 30. Boom, yeah. Um, all right, a teacher is creating an assignment worth 70 points. The assignment will con will consist of questions worth one point and questions worth three points, where um, which equation represents a situation where X represents the number of one point questions and y represents the number of three point questions. So usually they're gonna present x and y in the same order that you saw the quantities. So if if they said um x uh, if they said one point and three um three points in that order, then it's gonna be x representing one point and y representing three points in the same order usually. But I would check that because that's like a, a really cheap way where like even if you completely understand the question, you could still get it wrong that way. Um, okay, so the number of points is going to be 1 times x, because x is the number of one-point questions, plus 3 times y, because y is the number of three-point questions. So it's x plus 3y. And if that equals 70 points in total, then this is going to be equal 70. So it'll be x plus 3y equals 70. So d. All right, uh, right triangles LMN and PQR are similar, where L and M correspond to P and Q, respectively. Um, angle angle 5 has a measure of 53. Uh, sorry, angle M has a measure of 53. What is the measure of angle Q? So if L and N correspond to P and Q, sorry, L and M correspond to P and Q, um, that means that M, because a similar triangle is a triangle that has all the same um, all the same angles, right? So if angle M has a, a measure of 53 and it corresponds to Q, then Q is just going to have the same measure as angle as, as angle um, M. So it's going to be 53. If you really wanted, you could um, draw it. So let's say this is L M N. Oh, well, M has M is 53, so it wouldn't be that. So let's say this is LMN, and I'm drawing it a little smaller because it's similar. Um, and this is P, um, PQR. Yeah, you can see that M and R, or M and Q have the same value. Um, so it's also P, Q is also going to be fifty three. Okay. Um, number ten. 
so okay in general okay i'm gonna do this one through desmos because i haven't really showed you guys um i haven't really showed any uh, desmos for any of these questions yet so desmos is going to be your quick fix to like all of these system of equation questions so y equals negative 3x that's your first equation and then 4x plus y equals 15. that's your second equation and just look at their intersection point that's the solution to the system of equations that's going to be 15 and negative 45 so the value of x at their solution is going to be 15. Um, another sort of thing to notice when you're doing these types of questions is that if the coefficients of y are like um or, or any val variable are like that similar um like when they're literally the same that's sort of begging you to just do elimination so to me that's begging me to subtract um y equals negative 3x so i'm going to subtract y and i'm going to subtract negative 3x so that's going to cancel out and i'm going to get 4x equals 15 plus 3x so x is going to be 15. all right so which of the following equations is the most appropriate linear linear model for the data shown in the scatter plot um so for these ones uh in general i like to look at look at things by sort of like okay for for, for this line for example i would look at it by slope and then by um by intercept I wouldn't like I wouldn't see I wouldn't try to like make make the equation of this line. I know that can be satisfying, but it's inefficient. Uh just look for I always say look for the least amount of information you need to solve this. So here we can see that it's decreasing, meaning our slope is negative. So it's not going to be C or D. That's out of the way immediately. Um and then is the difference here is is our y intercept positive or negative? We can see clearly here that it's positive, so it's gonna be B. Because B has the positive Y intercept. All right, so the graph Y equals F of X is shown where um, the function F is defined by F of X equals AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D and A, B, C into our constant. Uh, for how many values of X does F of X equal zero? So I would just look at, I mean, this is asking you how many times does it intersect the X axis? So one, two, three, three. Okay, Vivian bought party hats and cupcakes for $71. Each packet of party, party hats costs $3 and each cupcake costs $1. Um, if Vivian bought 10 packages of party hats, how many cupcakes did she buy? Okay, so first find the number of, um, the, the amount of money she spent on party hats. That's going to be 3 times 10. And then the amount of uh, money she spent on cupcakes is going to be 1 times x. If x is the number of cupcakes she bought. Uh, yeah, number of cupcakes she bought. Um, so X is going to be 71 minus 30, so 41. All right, number 14, what is one of the solutions to the given equation? Um, I would just put this in Desmos really quick. Uh, don't do, don't, if it has a different variable than X, just change it to X, because uh, Desmos only really understands X and Y. Um, so you have x squared plus 10 at 10x minus 24 um, and then you can do either you can set that equal to zero and then it'll be two vertical lines at negative 12 and 2 or you can just leave that as a as a function and see where it intersects the the, the x-axis so it intersects the x-axis as negative 12 or 2 so for this one you can either put negative 12 or 2 uh, you can also just do this by factoring. So by factoring, you know that you want two numbers that multiply to negative 24 and add up to 10. So 12 and negative 2 would work. So this would be equal to z plus 12 times z minus 2 equals 0. So either z is going to be 2 uh, from this, or z is going to be negative 12. Uh, yeah, either way it works. Okay, uh, number 15, bacteria are growing in a liquid growth medium. There are th 300,000 cells per milliliter during an initial observation. The number of cells per, mi uh, from per milliliter doubles every three hours. 
how many cells per milliliter will there be 15 hours after the initial observation? Okay. So if it, if it doubles every three hours and 15 hours pass, that means it doubled um, five times. So I'm going to write two to the fifth. And it's going to be two to the fifth times the original number of cells there were. So two to the fifth times 300,000. All right, so 32 times three, that's 96. So it's going to be D. All right, uh, number 16, which expression is equivalent to, I'm not gonna read all that. Um, so first thing to notice about this is I always talk about like the verticality and like the, the parallels between the answer choices. So all of these have six X squared, um, uh, six X squared Y squared. So don't even try to look for the greatest common factor between six uh, X to the eighth Y squared and 12 X squared Y squared. Cause it already tells you that it already tells that six X squared um, Y squared. Uh, for this, I would just look at, you know, what you get when you factor those out. So divide 6x to the 8th y squared, you're going to get uh, by 6x squared y squared. So I'm going to write 6x to the 8th uh, y squared over 6x squared times y squared. So that y squared is going to cancel out. That 6 is going to cancel out. And then when you have um, exponents over exponents, you just subtract them. So subtract the exponent in the numerator, it's going to be x to the sixth. And that's all the information you need to know to solve the problem, because the only um, the only answer choice that has x to the sixth as one of the, the terms inside the parentheses is c. So it's going to be c. Yeah, in general, this is another illustration. Like, don't look for any more information than you need. I know it's satisfying to, like, completely uh, factor out, like, everything and like get an answer and then look to see which answer choice matches it but it's honestly too too time consuming i would just um look at it like buy piece of information uh to see which to see like the minimum amount that you need to figure out the question all right um so 17 a neighborhood consi consists of a two hectare park and a 35 hectare residential area uh, the total number of trees in the neighborhood is 3934 uh, the equation 2x plus 35y equals 3,934 represents this uh, situation. Which of the following is the best interpre interpretation of x in this context? Um, so a good way to think about this is sort of through units. So you can pretend like your unit for 3,924 is going to be trees. So let's say your unit for x is going to be, so x is, the unit is the number, or sorry, um, 2 is the number of hectares, and so it's 35. So it's going to be 2 hectare times x plus 35, I'll just write 35h, times y equals tree, number of trees. So it's like your unit on the, on the right side is number of trees. And so essentially, like what you want, you want x and y essentially to be in such a unit that when multiplied by hectares, it's gonna get tree. So what I mean by that is that X should be in trees per hectare. All right, trees per H, because when you multiply this by two H, the hectares are gonna cancel out and you're gonna get that the X, the two X is just in trees. And then the 35 Y is also just in trees. So you can sort of think of this as unit conversion uh, for like a linear equation. So yeah, X is going to be trees per hectare um, and it's specifically trees per hectare in the park because it talks about a two hectare park. Um, so it's going to be A. All right, uh, number 18. So you're essentially looking for, you don't need to read any of the like background it gives, just which of the equations like describes the, the graph. So it's not going to be A, because you can see that A has a positive slope, and this um, this line is very much negative. So it could be B, because, um, because if you have a line of the form AX plus BY equals C, your slope is equal to negative a over b. So 
so your slope is so if if the signs match, uh, then your slope is going to be negative times positive or positive. So your slope is going to be negative. So this works um, as far as the slopes go because this has a negative slope. Um, C doesn't work. So you're really between D and B. And now I would just plug in one of the intercepts to because that's the easiest thing to plug in. Um, so I would just plug in one of the intercepts to see which one works. So here this has a value at 0, 4, 40. Um, so does B have a value at 0, 40? So this would be 8 times 0. So just 0 plus 12 times 40. So 12 times 40 equals 480. So this becomes 480 times 480. So B would work. Okay. Um, circle A has a radius 3n and circle B has a radius of 129n, where n is a positive con constant. The area of circle B is how many times the area of circle A? Um, okay, so the area of circle B is going to be pi r squared, right? So 129 squared. 129n squared. One twenty nine n squared pi, and then the area of circle A is going to be three n squared pi. And you're looking for this fraction, so clearly the pi is going to cancel out, and then clearly the n is also going to, the n squared is going to cancel out. So this becomes one hundred twenty nine squared over three squared. So just put that in Desmos. It's eighteen forty nine. So. D works. All right, so the frequency table summarizes the 57 data values in a data set. What is the maximum data value in the data set? So just look at the maximum data value that has actually a frequency. So let's say they had 15 and zero here. The maximum wouldn't be 15 because there's no data values that had 15. Um, but you can see that the highest data value they have actually has a frequency. It has like actual data values that had that um, actual uh, data points that had that data value. Um, so yeah, it's just going to be 14. All right. Um, a circle in the xy plane has a diameter with endpoints 2, 4, and 2, 14. Um, an equation of the circle is x minus x minus 2 squared plus y minus 9 squared equals r squared, where r is a, is a positive constant. What is the value of r? Okay, so the equation of a circle is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared, where h, k is the center. So I'll type that. And R is the radius. Um, so, and, and sort of like a way to see like why this equation works is because if I took the square root of this, I would have X minus H squared, square root of X minus H squared plus square root of Y minus K squared. equals r. So, okay, square root of x minus h squared plus y minus k squared, what does that look like? That looks like the um, the distance formula, right? So what this sort of um, formula would be defining is it's the locus of points that, that are the, um, the distance r from hk, which is the same exact thing as a circle. So it makes sense why the circle equation is what it is. Um, but anyway, so r, so, so if it equals r squared, where r is the radius, just find the radius of this. So if it has a diameter from 14 to 4, that's going to be a diameter of 10. And so the diameter is 2 times the radius, so just divide by 2. And your radius, your r, is going to be 5. Okay. Um, the measure of angle r is uh, 2 pi over 3 radians. The measure of angle T is 5 pi over 12 radians greater than the measure of angle R. What is the measure of angle T in radians? 
So first I would add together these radian measures. So two pi over three plus five pi over 12. So two pi over three, that's eight pi over 12. So this is gonna be 13 pi over 12. And then to convert from radians to degrees, you just multiply by 180 degrees over pi. And the reason why that is, is because in degree, in degree measures, you have 360 degrees on the full arc length of a circle. And then according to your circumference formula, um, you have two pi r, so two pi radiuses um, in the full arc length of your circle, aka the circumference. So 360 equals two pi. Uh, so yeah, you would just, so just divide that by two, you have 180 degrees equals pi. Uh, so you can multiply it by, uh, multiply it by 180 over pi and it's just multiplying by one. So it doesn't change the value. Um, yeah, so now I just plug this into Desmos. So this is gonna be 13 times 180 over 12, 195. So let's see. All right, uh, number 23, a certain town has an area of 4.36 square miles. What is the area in square yards of this town? Um, so you have, you begin with 4.36 miles squared. And so we want to cancel out this miles and, and, uh, and end with, uh, yards, like square yards in this, in the, in the numerator. Um, so I'd multiply by 1760 yards over one mile. But clearly this is only gonna cancel out one of our miles because it's miles squared. So I would need to square this. So now I would have, I would end up with square yards and the miles squared would cancel out. So this is gonna be 4.36 times 1760 squared. So it's gonna be 13,505,000. So, D. Okay. So, for line H, the table shows three values of X and the corresponding values of Y. Line K is the result of translating H down five units in the XY plane. What is the intercept, X intercept of line K? Okay. So there's a couple of ways to do this question. So first thing to notice is that for every, so you have an increase of five here and an increase of 30. And then over here, you have an increase of three and an increase of 18. So your slope is gonna be 30 over five or 18 over three. So your slope is six, right? M equals six. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna translate um, this 130 down by five. So because on on line K, um, there, there's not going to be the point 18, 130 because it's translated down five units. There's going to be the point 18, uh, comma 125. And so essentially what I want to do now is I want to see how many like slopes I have to go through to um, make that 125 into a, to, to get to zero in that 125. Um, so what I mean by that is let's say we have the point eight, actually I'll do it in, in Desmos. So if I have the point 18, 125, I want to see essentially like how far down I have to go with the slope of six to get y equals zero, right? Because that's the x-intercept, it's at y equals zero. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how many slopes I have to go through, um, like how many units I have to go through to cancel out that 125. So the amount that that's going to be is, just, is going to be 125 over six. And sort of a way to see this is like also through unit conversion. So if you have 125y and then your slope 6 is y over x. So the amount of x values you have to go to the left for this to work is going to be 125 over 6. So 
So now I'm just going to subtract that from 18. So 18 minus 125 over 6. That's just the, um because that's how far left I need to go to make that 125 into a 0. Um, so that's negative 17 sixths. Um, so I can see that that's D. So negative 17 sixths. Um, you can also, uh, you can also sort of like make an equation out of this. Um, maybe that's a little more clear to you guys. Um, I feel like the way I just showed is faster, but you can also make an equation if it's clearer. Um, so clearly the slope is going to be six. So you can write y equals six x plus b. And then I can just solve, I can plug in, uh, any point here. So the point is going to be 18, 125, right? Not 18, 130, because this is translated down five points. So I can just plug in 18 and 125 to make this work. So 6 times 18 equals 125 plus b. So b is going to be 125 minus 6 times 18. Uh, so it's going to be 17, I think. Yeah, 17. So 125. So our equation is going to be 175, 125 equal, or sorry, not 125, y equals 6x plus 17. And now I can just plug in 0 for y. So 0 equals 6x plus 17. And now just solve for x. Um, x is going to be negative 17 over 6. So yeah, whichever way is like faster for you. Um, I feel like the first way is a little faster for me, but, you know, whatever works for you guys. Okay, in the xy plane, the graph of the equation y equals negative x squared plus 9x minus 100 intersects the line y equals c at exactly one point. What is the value of, of c? So a couple ways to do this. Um... So, okay, the line y equals c. So this is telling you that y equals c, right? So I can I can replace y with c. So c equals negative x squared plus 9x minus 100. So I'm going to um, make this equal to 0. So it's going to be negative x squared plus 9x minus parentheses 100 plus c right because it's minus 100 minus c so minus parentheses 100 plus c and so this represents uh the the intersections between y equals c and y equals negative x squared plus 9x minus 100 so if they intersect at only exactly one point we want the discriminant um b squared minus 4ac to equal zero so i'm going to explain what that is so you have, according to your quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. And so this is what x equals. So, so essentially what this, we can sort of read into this equation. So if b squared minus 4ac, if that's a positive value, that, and that needs to be a positive value for the, um, for, for the equation to have real solutions, right? Because you can't you can't take the square root of a negative number. So, all right, if b squared minus 4a squared minus 4ac, if that's a positive number, then you're gonna have basically negative b over 2a plus or minus, uh, two, plus or minus the number, so you're gonna have two solutions. So, all right, if that's positive, two roots, If that's zero, then square root of b, if b squared minus 4a is zero, then its square root is going to be zero. So both of the roots are just going to be negative b over two, negative b over 2a plus or minus zero. So they're going to be the same exact thing. So if that's equal to zero, then you're only going to have one root. So again, b squared minus 4ac is called the discriminant. And then if that's negative, you're taking square root of a negative number. So that's not going to have any solutions zero well any uh real roots it's gonna have complex roots but that's doesn't matter um 
So if it's saying that it, it, it intersects at exactly one point, you want there to be exactly one real root in this solution, uh, or exactly one real solution in this uh, equation. So just set negative or b squared minus 4ac equal to 0. So that's going to be 81 minus negative 1 times 4 times negative 100 plus c or negative 100 minus c. Right, because that's a, that's four, and that's c. Uh, so now that's gonna so okay, just multiply this out and set this equal to zero. By the way, so you're gonna have eighty one equals negative four hundred minus four c. So now just add 400 to both sides. You're going to get 481 equals negative 4c. And then just divide by negative 4 on both sides. You're going to get four, negative 481 over 4. So it'll be a. Um, there's also a way you can do this with Desmos. Um, so y equals c. So that's going to be a horizontal line. Right, because y equals a constant value. So if it intersects that um, value at exactly one point, essentially just look for um, so whatever that wh whatever that um, that y equals c is going to be tangent to that parabola. Um, so it's going to intersect it only at its vertex. So I would just see. Um, where that vertex is, it's at negative 79.75, uh, which, spoiler, is equal to negative 481 over 4. So, yeah, you can do that through Desmos, or you can do that through um, just calculation. All right. So I already kind of did the, the next one. Uh, I did it through, like, a Desmos, a little Desmos hack. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go over it again. So that Desmos hack that I did is, so if X and Y are defined um, to like sort of um, to another variable, um, that's something called a parametric equation. Um, and so we can enter those into Desmos by just typing in an ordered pair. And for the parameter, so R, um, but I'm going to change that to T because uh, Desmos only understands T. You have to change uh, the parameter into T. So this is going to be negative 3 over 2T. Uh, and I'm only going to do B to show that it works, um, because B is the right answer. So it's going to be negative 3 over, uh, negative 3T over 2 plus 7 halves, comma, T. So it has a range of values for T. I'm going to make that a little bit of a bigger range. So we can see that's a line right here. And then our, our, our like, equation of the line was 2X plus 3Y equals 7. So clearly, uh, the, the black line and the red line, they lie, they're the same thing, right? So clearly, um, B is the equivalent form of, uh, of a, uh, of of this equation. Another way of verifying that, um, is to sort of solve for like x in 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 relation to y. So, what I'm going to do with this equation is I'm going to solve for x. So this is going to be x equals 7 minus 3y over 2. And now I'm just going to plug in plug in r, because that's the value of y that uh, b gives us, to see if that works. So this should, so x is equal to negative 3r over 2, plus uh, 7 halves. So this should be the same thing once we plug in r for y. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that right now. I'm gonna plug in r for y. So this is gonna be seven minus three r over two. Which yeah, if we were to break up this, this fraction, we would see that these are the same. Like break up the fraction right here, we would see that these are the same thing. So b is gonna be right. Um, 
this question is a little annoying because you kind of just have to go through each answer choice and see which one works. Um, but yeah. All right, so number 27, uh, the perimeter of an equilateral triangle is 624 centimeters. The height of this triangle is K root three uh, centimeters, where K is a constant. What is the value of K? All right, so always draw a diagram if you don't know. Um, not saying you guys don't know, but I'm saying I'm gonna draw a diagram. So if the perimeter of an equilateral triangle is 624 centimeters, each side is just going to be 624 divided by 3, which is 208, I think. Uh, yeah, so this is 208. And then it tells you the height of the triangle is k root 3. This does not look equilateral. I mean, I doubt I could draw an equilateral triangle, but okay, that's as close as I'm going to get. Okay, so wait, let me make that a little bigger. Okay, um... So if, okay, so you have each of your sides equals 208 and your height equals k root 3. So what also, you, okay, so your height, that's, it's going to be perpendicular to, um, to, to your side, to the side that it's drawn to. It's going to be the altitude of that side because that measures the distance from a line to a point, uh, the perpendicular, the altitude to that, uh, to that line. Uh, so... This is going to be k root 3, and it's going to be perpendicular. And then since all the angles in an equilateral triangle are 60 degrees, this is going to be a 30, 60, 90 right triangle. And so since this altitude bisects uh, this 208 side, one side is going to be 104, and the other side is also going to be 104. And so now you have your 30, 60, 90 right triangle. So in a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, the sides opposite each angle are going to be x times x, x root 3, and 2x. So what I mean that by that is the side opposite the 30 degrees is going to be x. It's going to be your reference side. Uh, the side opposite the 60 degree angle is going to be x times root 3. And then the side opposite your 90 degree angle is going to be 2x. So you can see that the side opposite your um your 30 degree angle is 104 and so the side opposite your 60 degree angle is going to be 104 times root 3 so 104 times root 3 equals k times root 3 so that means that k equals 104 <laughs> okay um so that's the math module one um instead of moving on to the next module i just want to ask if you guys have like any questions um, about the math or I guess about the the test in general. So just le let me know in the chat. Okay, uh, if you guys don't have any, then I'll just do, I'll do some of like the last, um, the last problems on the math module two, um, because those tend to be the harder ones. So let's start at question 23. So what is the diameter of the circle in the xy plane with equation x minus five squared plus y minus three squared equals 16? So we just talked about this. This is the area, this is the, um, this is the equation of our circle. And so that equals r squared. So 16 is 4 squared, so your radius is 4. Uh, and your diameter is just going to be 2 times the radius, so it's going to be 8. So 23 would be b. 
And then 24, for the exponential function f, the value of f of 1 is k, where k is a constant. Uh, which of the following um, equivalent forms of the function f show the value of k as the coefficient or the base? So essentially k, so f of 1, uh, could either be what you take to the power of x. So it could be, you know, like x f of 1 to the power of x plus 1. Or it could be f of 1. as the coefficient, so, you know, it would be f of 1 times 1. 1.6 times x to the whatever, um, or 1.6 1. 1. to the power of x uh, minus or plus whatever. Um, so, yeah, either, so either your k is going to be your function, uh, your, your, your base or your coefficient. Um, so what draws my eye is, so f of 1 equals k, right? So what draws my, my eye is the x minus 1 in c. Uh, because I've, if I were to plug in, um, if I were to plug in one, I would get one point six times uh, to the to the zeroth power, right? Which is just one. So plugging in x, I would get that f of one equals one twenty eight, and it said k that k can either be your coefficient or your base. So clearly here k is our coefficient, so c would work. In general, for these like more for these questions that are more about like try every single answer choice and see which one works, I would scan all the answer choices and see which one is like sort of the easiest to test for, and maybe it's like immediately going to jump out of you out at you. Um, so yeah, for so like when I was just looking through the answer choices, C jumped out uh, jump out at me, uh, because I saw the x minus one. All right. Um, a model estimates that at the end of each year from 2015 to 2020, the number of squirrels in a population was 150% more than the number of square, squirrels in the population at the end of the previous year. Um, the model estimates that at the end of 2016, there were um, 180 uh, squirrels in the population. Uh, which of the following est equations represents this model, where n is the number of squirrels and the population t years in the population t years after um, the end of 2015? And t is less than or equal to five. Okay. So if it's one hundred and fifty percent more than uh the number of squirrels, so the number of squirrels in the population at the end of the previous year is one hundred percent, right? You have one hundred percent of the population of squirrels in that population of squirrels. So if it's one hundred fifty percent more, then in total it's going to be two hundred fifty percent just of that population. So your base is going to be two hundred fifty percent or two point five. So right off the bat, you can get rid of A and C. And now from here, I would just plug in, um, I would just plug in one and uh, one and 180 and see if it works, right? Because at the end of 2016, T would be one, right? Um, so I would just plug in one and see if it's equal to 180. So I'm plugging that into B right now. So 772 times 2.5 to the 1. I want that to equal 180. So 72 times 2.5, so that does equal 180. So it'll be B. All right, this is the last one I'm going to do. Uh, so number 26, uh, in the given pair of equations, A and B are constants. Uh, the graph of this pair of equations in the xy plane is a pair of perpendicular lines. Uh, which of the following pair of equations also represents a pair of perpendicular lines? Okay, so if, okay, so perpendicular lines, uh, one line, they have, their slopes are going to be the negative reciprocal of the other. So the 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 slope of five x plus seven y equals one. That's going to be negative a over b, so it's going to be negative five sevenths. So the slope of a x y plus b a a x plus b y equals one. That's going to be negative eight over b, and that equals the negative reciprocal of uh negative five over seven. So that's going to be seven fifths. Um. Okay. So now that's sort of all we need to know for um to solve this question. So A 
the the um the slope of the first equation is going to be negative 10 over 7. And then the slope of the second equation is going to be negative a over negative 2b, so a over 2b. And we know that negative a over 2b, uh, negative a over b equals uh, 7 fifths. So this is going to be negative 7 fifths. times 2. So this is going to be negative 7 tenths. So that's close, but we would want um, the the um, the slope of this line to be the negative reciprocal of the other one. So we want it to be 7 tenths, not, um, not, not, not negative 7 tenths. So it's not going to be A. Um, and then so for, for B, the slope would also be negative 10 over 7 for the first one. And then the slope of the second line is going to be negative a over 2b. So we know that negative a over b equals 7 fifths. So this is going to be 7 over 5 times 2. So it's going to be 7 tenths. Uh, so this works because it's equal to the negative reciprocal of the slope of our other line. So b works. Um, in general, with like the the sort of questions where you have to try out like the all the answer choices, usually, uh, if the answer choice that's that's correct, it doesn't like immediately jump out. Usually, it's going to be pretty early in the answer choices, so it's going to be like A or B because they don't really expect that you can like try all four answer choices for like every question where you have to do that. Uh, so yeah, I would start looking with you know A or B, obviously. Um, okay, so that's all I have to get through. So. Yeah, I wish you guys luck for um for 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 your test on Saturday. Um, let me know how it goes. Uh, if any of you guys are in my class, um, is everyone is everyone here? Are are you guys taking the the SAT on Saturday? Okay, I got a thumbs up. Okay, I would assume most of you are. Um, so. Okay, I think most of you are. So yeah, I hope you guys do well on that on Saturday. Um, so yeah, if you guys are in my class, let me know if, uh, how it goes. Um, hopefully this was helpful. Can I get a thumbs up or a thumbs down if this was helpful? All right, thumbs up, that's good. Um, yeah, so in general, I hope that like sort of doing uh, these, these questions like as a class and talking through them sort of shows that you you like you guys definitely are smart enough to do all of them it's sort of like having that clear reasoning and sort of as i say like anticipating the answer explanations so um like understanding why they would um what college board would write about their own questions and what they want to test with each question that that sort of gets you through it um so yeah i hope that was helpful and i hope you guys have a great night and good luck on saturday if if you're taking it on saturday bye